All right, so the last part of the cardiovascular system we're going to talk about are the blood vessels. And these are those closed set of tubes that form the delivery routes to the cells of the body. So the vascular system is widespread and intimate. It uses those vessels as large as the aorta and as small as the microscopic capillaries to reach the cells of the body. You can see just how intimate and how elaborate all of these blood vessels are. <clears throat> so uh, we have a lot of vesselage going to the head, a lot of vesselage going there. What's going on there? That's right, that's the lungs for gas exchange. A lot of vesselage going there. What's going on there? That's the abdomen, digestive viscera. So this is a schematic here um, of the pulmonary and systemic circulations. And, you know, one, I want you to distinguish between the two. Here we have the right side of the heart sending blood up to the pulmonary circulation, and then it comes back to the left side of the heart. And I want to just remind you that the pulmonary circuit is strictly for gas exchange between the blood and the atmosphere. Okay, it's not, it's, there's no exchange occurring with uh, the actual cells of the body. And that's where the systemic circuit comes into play. So the systemic circuit coming out of the left side of the heart reaches all the tissues of the, tissues of the body and serves their cellular needs. And so as the aorta comes off here, this is just a sampling, but you can see all these branches going to the different organs of the body uh, to serve their cellular needs. And this is a little more... Uh, elaborate picture of that. It shows you just how extensive all this stuff is. So here's the aorta, and uh, you have all these arteries coming off, you know, that are uh, that are going to the different tissues of the body. And this is up here in the, in the thorax and the chest. This is the thoracic aorta. Then you pass through the diaphragm, and it becomes the abdominal aorta. And that's when you see, again, all of these uh, blood vessels branching off to reach the different tissues of the body and supply their cellular needs. Okay, so there's three major blood vessel types. Blood leaving the heart passes into arteries. So arteries are one type of blood vessel. Then these arteries branch and branch and branch, and they eventually feed into capillaries where the exchange of materials occurs. So capillaries are the second type of blood vessel. And then these capillaries are drained by veins, which return blood to the heart. So veins are the third type of, third type of vessel. So let's take a look at these capillaries first. These are the smallest blood vessels in the body. They're microscopic. Um, their average length is one millimeter, and their average lumen diameter is just about eight to ten mic micrometers, which doesn't mean a whole lot to you, I guess, but it's just large enough for red blood cells to fit through here single file. So here we have some uh, adipose tissue, which is highly vascular, and here's a capillary running through it. And because of this narrow diameter, the red blood cells have to fit through there single file. So why is that good? Why is it good to have them fit through single file instead of having a large vessel like that where you have where you have a, a bunch of them going through at one time? And the answer to that is it increases the time that each red blood cell, cell spends in the capillary bed so it increases exchange time. So only capillaries have intimate contact with the cells of the body and directly serve their cellular needs. And you guys have seen this before, and that's illustrating it. Here we have an arterial which feeds the capillary bed, single file red blood cells coming through, and these are all the cells of the body that these are exchanging materials with. Okay, so these are the different types of capillaries, um, and these are the different names. You guys are not, not responsible for these names. But um, what they do is they, these are the uh, least leaky, and these are the most leaky capillaries. So these over here have the least amount of exchange, and these over here have the most amount of exchange. And I just want to look where these are located. Okay? The, with the least amount of exchange, we have stuff in the skin. Also, uh, the small intestine has a moderate amount of exchange. Okay? And then it, that's opposed to... Over here, these super leaky capillaries and uh, the lymphoid organs, for instance, uh, have super leaky capillaries. And so why is that the case? Why do, we, why do we want super leaky in the lymphoid organs but not so much in the skin and the small intestine? 
and that, uh, well, that has to do with the functions of them, okay? Um, we don't want pathogens that have breached the skin to be able to easily get in through the capillaries. And same thing with uh, pathogens that have breached the small intestine. We don't want them to have easy access into the blood supply. But when blood's throwing through these lymphoid organs, remember what's going on here. You have white blood cells all outside here looking for pathogens. And so you want them to be able to, uh, to move into and out of the capillaries. And then this is a close-up. These are some different capillary exchange mechanisms. So they can diffuse through these gaps, through these fenestrations. They can be transported over, you know, all, all sorts of different types of things. Okay, so let's move on to arteries and veins. Arteries and veins have three distinct layers, also called tunics, that surround a central blood-containing space called the lumen. Uh, the innermost layer is the tunica intima, and this lines the lumen of all vessels. So the tunica intima lines the, lines the lumen of all vessels. And what the tunica intima does is it contains a single layer of simple squamous epithelium. So here's your simple squamous epithelium. The cells fit tight together, tight together, and what they do is they form a slick surface that minimizes friction as blood is going through the lumen here. And actually, when we get down to the capillary level, all capillaries are, is the tunica intima. They, the only thing they are is this thin layer of simple squamous cells. Then we have the tunica media. So here's the tunica media right there. And this is mostly circular arranged, smooth muscle cells, and also sheets of elastin fibers in there. Okay. So first of all, what are these elastic fibers doing? Why do we want these elastic fibers in there? Well, it allows for stretch, and it also allows for recoil, okay, which are going to be important properties when we talk about the elastic arteries. Then what about the smooth muscle, this, this circularly arranged smooth muscle? Well, that allows for both vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And then the outermost layer here is the uh, tunica externa. And this mostly has collagen fibers in it. They're going to protect and uh, reinforce the vessel and anchor it to uh, surrounding structures. Okay, so let's uh, go in a little more depth about the arteries here. So arteries are divided into three groups based on their relative size and function. And the first of these are the elastic arteries. These are the largest. These are the thick-walled arteries near the heart, the aorta and its, and its uh, major branches. And they're going to have really large lumens, which is going to allow them to transport or conduct blood out of the heart to, uh, to the smaller areas of the body. So the elastic arteries conduct blood out of the heart to the, to the next arteries, which are the mus muscular arteries. And these are the arteries that are going to deliver the blood to the specific areas of the body. Then we have the uh, arterioles. So muscular arteries... Um, branch into arterioles, and actually it's the arterioles that feed the capillaries within the different tissues of the body. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go to the elastic arteries here. The elastic arteries include the aorta and its major branches. So here's the aorta, goes all the way down uh, through the abdominal cavity and also the brachiocephalic trunk here, common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. These are all elastic arteries, as well as the pulmonary trunk that comes out of the right side of the heart. So right there, the pulmonary trunk. And elasticity is critically important in these vessels because these are closest to the heart, and they need to withstand the greatest pressure fluctuations between ventricular contraction and relaxation. So blood's going to pump out of the left side of the heart, and that's a huge amount of pressure with blood coming out through the aorta, so the aorta needs to be able to expand and then be able to recoil on that as well. And that's what, uh, that's what this is showing here. This is what these elastic fibers allow for. This is the ventricle, and let's see. So this is the ventricle in the relaxed position, 
and then it contracts. So this is the ventricle in the contract position. And when it does that, it shoots blood out through the aorta, a huge amount of blood. And that aorta and the other elastic arteries need to be able to expand to absorb some of that pressure and also, yeah, to absorb some of that pressure. And then what happens is when the ventricles relax, then that'll, and blood is not going into the aorta, that elasticity allows the aorta to recoil on the, on the uh, blood and maintain pressure so we're able to maintain flow. And this is, uh, yeah, you can see this here. This is uh, the wall of the aorta right here. And um, look at all these elastic fibers in there. Okay, so um, there's something related to this, to this elasticity called atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis is the most common form of what's called arteriosclerosis, which is the hardening of the arteries. So with atherosclerosis, you get these small patchy thickenings called atheromas uh, that form and they intrude into the vessel lumen. And uh, what's that doing here? What's this atheroma, different color, what's that atheroma doing right there? Well, it's narrowing the arteries, which is, a, which is a big problem. And they can also become calcified plaques. And so instead of becoming, uh, instead of being elastic, they have more of a, a bone-like consistency to them. And they're not able to expand and, uh, and recoil. And there's a video that I'd like you guys to watch. This is uh, referenced in your study questions. And um, what you do is you can identify the steps that lead to the formation of this atheroma here. So when we have these calcified arteries that lack elasticity, um, the, the arteries act like a garden hose. So when the ventricle contracts, it shoots blood out rapidly and there's a tremendous amount of pressure on the garden hose. And then when the ventricle relaxes, and then just a little bit of blood is coming out because the elasticity isn't there and it can't recoil on that to maintain the pressure. And so what happens is with every heartbeat, you have a lot of blood coming out, then a little. Then a little. And um, this isn't good. This is inconsistent blood supply to the tissues. This inability to expand also means there's extreme hypertension with every heartbeat. Okay, and this, this can weaken artery walls and cause an aneurysm, a balloon-like outpocketing of an artery wall that uh, places it at risk for rupture. And um, as you can imagine, you know, aneurysms aren't good. Here's a thoracic aneurysm. There's an abdominal aneurysm. Some additional problems that can arise from this. Here's a, here's a severely um, complicated plaque. This is a hardened calcified atheroma. And that's all the lumen that we're left with right there. Okay, so besides the hypertension and the inability to expand and recoil, what, what's the problem with this? Well, um, an embolism or a traveling mass can travel down the blood vessel and it can get caught there. And what that does is it, it cuts off blood to the downstream tissues, okay, which obviously is not good. And if this happens in the brain, that's called a stroke. You get an embolism in there, cuts off, cuts off blood flow to the area of the brain. Another problem is that this plaque itself can break off, roll down the arteries, which become smaller, and then at some point when it gets to those smaller arteries, it can lead to a blockage itself. Okay, then we have the muscular arteries. So the elastic arteries give, give way to the muscular arteries, and these arteries are going to deliver blood to the specific organs of the body. So these are, uh, these are most of the named arteries in the body. So for instance, here's the heart, and we have, it's not shown here, but this is uh, the left subclavian artery. Then we have the axillary, the brachial, the radial, the ulnar. These are our mu all muscular arteries here. Okay, the carotid artery, all these arteries that are taking, taking blood to specific areas of the body, these are all muscular arteries. This is the uh, abdominal aorta. All these branches off the abdominal aorta, these are all muscular arteries here. So muscular arteries contain large amounts of smooth muscle, which means they're active in vasomotion, vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So here is, uh, 
here's all that smooth muscle in these muscular arteries. And uh, what does this vasomotion allow us to do? What does vasoconstriction and vasodilation allow us to do? Well, it allows us to shunt blood to the areas of the body that need it most. This is cardiac output at rest during exercise. How is it that we're able to, at rest, have a lot of blood going to the abdomen, and then during exercise, not so much? Okay, we're vasoconstricting that area. And then on that note, um, something that I need to point out here is that blood vessels are almost entirely innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic doesn't have any innervation of the blood vessels. So what happens is that the sympathetic nervous system continually fires to keep the blood vessels in a partial state of constriction, which we call sympathetic tone. And that's what this is representing, these little slashes right there represent impulses that are coming down the sympathetic neurons and causing some constriction of the smooth muscle layer there. Now when blood pressure is too low, the sympathetic neurons fire more rapidly, which is what you're seeing there, and that causes uh, vasoconstriction and widespread raising of blood pressure. This is also how, let's say, during exercise when we want to send blood to skeletal muscles. Well, how are we going to send it there? Um, we're going to, well, first of all, the, the skeletal muscles, blood vessels to those are going to be weakly dilated by epinephrine. But uh, we're also going to vasoconstrict blood vessels that go to the non-essential organs during exercise, like the abdominal viscera, the skin, at least initially, and the kidneys. Okay, we're going to, we're going to vasoconstrict blood going to these areas so it goes elsewhere in the body, in particular to uh, skeletal muscles, areas that need it most. Okay, the next thing we have are arterioles. So muscular arteries, here's a muscular artery, gives way to arterioles. And arterioles feed the capillary beds. So minute-to-minute -minute blood flow into the capillary beds is going to be determined by arterial diameter, which is, which is under uh, neuronal, hormonal, chemical control. And so the point here is that this is just another level of control that we have over blood going to certain areas. If we want blood to bypass this capillary bed, then we simply vasoconstrict the arterial that's, that's feeding it into there. Okay, then the capillaries unite to form uh, veins, and in particular, the first one is what are called a post-capillary venule. Then we get small veins and large veins, which return the blood to the heart. All right, so uh, here's some histology. Here's a, here's a vein. Here's an artery. And something you might notice about veins is veins have really large lumens and also thin walls. And what this means is that they can accommodate a large amount of blood. And in fact, up to 65% of the body's blood supply at any time is found in the veins. And that's what this is showing right here. This is the percentage of blood that's found in different areas of the body. 15% is in the systemic circulation. 12% is in the pulmonary circulation. 8% is actually traveling through the heart in the chambers of the heart. 5% in the capillaries. Then here we have 60% that's, uh, that's in the veins. Now here we're looking at systemic blood pressure. And here we have the aorta, and the aorta, not surprisingly, is under the highest pressure. This is systolic pressure, this is diastolic pressure right there. And then as you travel further away from the heart, the, the pressure in these vessels goes way down. And so by the time you get to the, to the venous system, we're under extremely low pressure here. And that's a problem because we need to return this blood to the heart, okay? And if it's under low pressure, then it's, uh, then it's going to have trouble doing that. And so there's some modifications that, uh, that are made to help return this blood, this venous blood, to the heart. And one of those are those larger diameter lumens. You have a large diameter lumen, that means that there's less resistance against the walls of the blood vessel. So that's one thing that's going on. Two, we have muscular pumps, and this is the same for the lymphatic system. We have, venous, we have uh, the venous system, which runs through skeletal muscles. And when skeletal muscles contract, they press against these deep veins, create pressure, 
and which sends blood up through the veins. And this works only in conjunction with one-way venous valves. So we have one-way venous valves in there, which allow blood to only flow one way through the veins. So the skeletal muscles contract. That sends blood up through this valve. And then when it's done contracting, this valve closes and keeps this blood up here. So blood keeps working its way up and up and up. Now, if you have faulty or incompetent valves, then you're not getting the, the return of blood back to the heart like you need. And that, uh, that manifests itself as uh, varicose veins here. You have faulty valves here, and so this venous blood is not able to return back up to the heart. And lastly, there's uh, something called the respiratory pump, which, I'm, which uh, let's see. So basically, when we breathe... We breathe in and we breathe out. Uh, that causes pressure changes in the, uh, in the ventral body cavity, and those pressure changes also help move venous blood back up to the heart. And the last thing I want to point out is the relationship between vessel length and obesity. Okay, this is adipose tissue here, and adipose tissue is highly vascularized because it has a high metabolic activity. Okay, We want to store fat and then we want to get it into the blood. But um, the problem with that is that each pound of fat, extra fat, requires miles of additional blood vessels to serve it. Okay, so all this added vessel length increases resistance, and it causes the heart to work a lot harder to overcome the friction. So this is liposuction right here, and uh, the reason I point this out is because uh, when you're taking out fat from the body, there's so much blood here that you can only take out a little fat at a time, without losing, uh, so you don't lose too much blood. So here you can see where the fat tissue has separated from the blood. This is all blood from adipose tissue here, and then this stuff hasn't quite separated. Okay, and then uh, lastly here, this is the organization of the, of the vascular system, and uh, this is for the lab material only for the most part. And I just want to kind of go through and, and talk you through how these vessels are organized. So first of all, here's the, uh, here's the aorta. So here's the aorta right there. And the first branches off the aorta, the aorta are the right and left coronary arteries there that are supplying the coronary circulation. But other than that, we have three major branches at the top. And I want to start on the right-hand side here. Actually, that's the patient's left-hand side. So I want to start on the patient's uh, left-hand side here. So here we have the aorta that comes out. And the last one is, uh, this is the left subclavian artery. And subclavian means below the clavicle. So the left subclavian artery moves underneath the clavicle. Then when it gets in the armpit region, it becomes the axillary artery. It's the same artery, just, uh, just a different name at that point. Then it goes through the brachial region, and it becomes the brachial artery. Then it branches, and there's a branch that travels down the, the radius, and there's a branch that travels down the ulna, and these are the radial and the ulnar arteries. So that's one of those branches. The, the next branch in is the left common carotid artery. So there's the left common carotid that's going to feed the head. Now the same thing is going on on the right-hand side here. This is the uh, right subclavian, right axillary, right brachial, right common carotid artery. The only difference with this is instead of each of these vessels having their own place where they come out of the aorta, they come out of the aorta through a vessel called the brachiocephalic trunk. So here's the brachiocephalic trunk right there, and it branches to become the right common carotid and the right subclavian artery. So uh, all of that there is the same on the right and left. It's just a little different how it comes out of the aorta. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is the uh, ascending aorta. That's the aortic arc. And then it descends all the way through the thoracic and abdominal cavities. But uh, specifically, this is the thoracic aorta. And this is the 
abdominal aorta right there after it goes through the diaphragm. And I want you guys to differentiate between those two instead of calling it the descending aorta. But uh, as you go through the abdomen here, you know, you can just see that there's more branches off here. There's a celiac trunk there. There is a, uh, this is a superior mesenteric. These are renal arteries that are going to the kidneys. Okay. And then it comes down in at the hip area here and it branches. And it branches and it becomes the, first one is the common iliac artery. Then it becomes the external iliac artery. And then it runs through the femur and it becomes the femoral artery right there. And these are some of those, uh, these are those branches that are, that are coming through here. And for the clay blood vessel project, you guys are going to need to, uh, need to have uh, all of these coming off the aorta. So here we have the celiac trunk, and a trunk branches, and you have one of the branches going to the spleen. That's the splenic artery. You have another one called the left gastric artery. Where's that one going? That's going to the stomach. And then you have another one called the hepatic artery, and that's going, as you can imagine, to the liver. Then we have the superior mesenteric artery here, and this is going to supply, you know, a lot of the digestive viscera with, uh, with blood. Yeah, here's that celiac trunk. So here's your celiac trunk, then you have your splenic artery, common hepatic, and then your uh, gastric. This is the superior mesenteric artery. So the superior mesenteric artery comes off and then it just branches into all these other different arteries that are serving the, uh, serving the digestive viscera, the small intestines, large intestine, all that kind of stuff. Okay. And then we have the venous system. So the venous system drains the capillaries and it's returned to the heart. And uh, let's see, here we have jugular veins, returning blood from the head. Here we have subclavian veins, returning blood from the arms. And eventually these all go, these ones go into the superior vena cava. And then here's the inferior, which drains the lower body here. Thank you.